money-back guarantee for the low price of $2.99. As the 70s progressed, K-Tail became more and more like an engine requiring fuel. Every new product or album had to be more successful than the previous release. Much of the pressure came in the form of share prices, as the company was now traded publicly. With investors demanding returns, the company ventured into new areas, like the wine industry and, believe it or not, the movie business. Dean Jones uses eggs that explode to fight his way out of captivity and, with the help of his shaggy dog, Dylan, outsmarts and captures the entire gang of criminals and then wins the heart of his girl. Mr. Super Invisible, entertainment for the whole We've family. started to get Tom under tremendous pressure to create profit. It's like the classic case. You start formative years, go-go years, and then pressure years. Despite KTEL's ability to generate cash from monstrous album sales, the music industry as a whole viewed them with mixed feelings. On one hand, the labels and publishers enjoyed collecting royalties. On the other hand, KTEL releases would often top the charts, making it tough for labels and their artists to reach that number one spot. They hated us. They really didn't mind me licensing the record, but they would have liked me to take the LPs and throw them into Lake Winnipeg, where they were spending thousands of dollars trying to break an artist. We ended up going on the air, and within a week or two, we were at the top of the charts. And we, you know, they got Elton John trying to break an album into number one, and we were number one. This rocky relationship was about to take a turn for the worse. A team of producers working out of Nashville pitched KTEL on re-recording artists no longer under contract to their original labels. The majority of the artists that we were dealing with were on their back nine of their careers and looked at this as another payday on a record that they probably had not been paid for in some time from the original record company. So here was an opportunity to go do lightning in a bottle in a, in a, you know, a good hour's worth of work and get your check and go home. The volume and variety of artists who re-entered the studio was staggering. Little Richard, Perry Como, Chubby Checker, Eddie Arnold, Ben E. King, Etta James, and B.J. Thomas. These were just a few who stepped up for a KTEL payday. It's, it's, you know, it's not the money, it's the money. Uh, you know, we, we made money doing it. They sold a lot of records, and that, and that covers a lot of uh, indecision and a lot of second guessing about something. They have been a very important part of uh, the music business, just in the units and the, and the records they sold. Thousands of recordings were done for KTEL. Literally thousands. The way they came in, they just came in and one after the other, one after the other, after the other. It was just like it was like a, a train that uh, was bringing them in. And, uh, that was the exciting part of it. It's really hard to go back and try to try to re recreate that. You know, on, on Hooked on a Feeling, uh, the the drummer Gene Chrisman was playing tin cans and had a tin pot and a and a pot lid and a, the side of a chair he was doing some percussion with and it's really hard to go back and try to try to you know recreate some of that some of those things you know 99 percent of the people can't really tell the difference these new masters became the property of KTEL which meant they never again had to buy these songs from companies who owned the original recordings it was a shrewd move for KTEL but a major thorn in the side of the music industry. KTL came along at a time, and they got a lot of resistance, really, because back then it was really a very competitive business, so the record labels were very protective of their artists. They didn't want them on somebody else's label. The record companies were saying, well, you're we're recording our artists, and you're competing us against us in that area as well, as, as well as putting out records. And the record companies would sometimes frown upon it that we could deal directly with the artists by bypassing them. And um, it caused us some, some problems now and then, you know. The strategy to create their own library of music would eventually lead to a showdown between KTEL and the music industry. The 1980s and the company's greatest challenge lay just ahead.
By 1980, KTEL could do no wrong. They were selling more music than any other independent label in the world. And they even released a smash hit of their own, Hooked on Classics. And the record became uh, like a number one, number two single in the US. But got, we got a Grammy nomination for it, and we sold about 10, 15 million, I can't remember how many albums now, but it became a worldwide hit. That was our biggest album, and we then developed a series, Hooked on Swing, Hooked on Greek Music, and we, we milked it for all it was worth. The, the World Philharmonic Orchestra were almost going broke, and I remember the very first check we gave them was over a quarter of a million pounds, and it wiped out the deficit. And in fact, they were so pleased that the Queen Mother, she appeared at a benefit concert with Luciana Pavarotti at the Royal Albert Hall. And um, it says, isn't this a wonderful achievement? And congratulations, young man. I wish you many more successes. I said, thank you, Mom. This was a proud moment. Unbeknownst to KTEL, the Hooked On series would become one of their last great successes. A new direction in the company was being charted out of the head office in Winnipeg. A direction that had nothing to do with gadgets or music. You get to a point where the music business is operating fine, the product business is operating fine, and there isn't really a way to, to grow it to any extent. KTEL's success, particularly in the music business, had allowed them to build up an enormous cash reserve. As the money continued flowing in, KTEL diversified by expanding into oil and gas, real estate, and mail-order music. It wasn't long before things began to go very, very wrong. We had $35 million in the bank, and we were, we were, we were generating $8 million a year interest. And Philip said to us, I'm going into gas and oil and real estate, but that doesn't mean you're not going to have a job next year. We were buying real estate in Phoenix and real estate in Dallas and oil wells in, in Calgary and the bottom fell off. The big loser was the mail order business in the U.S. and it was not only a, a, a cash user but a big cash loser as well. As the new businesses struggled, they began eating up more and more of the cash KTEL had in the bank. Suddenly, the company was having a hard time meeting their financial obligations. And once people start hearing you have a problem in this country, you have a problem with that country, they start pulling the rug out from under you everywhere. So you, you get major companies balking at the f uh, fact that you, you, just, you could not license tracks from them any, anymore. So your albums get, kept getting weaker and weaker and weaker. Get ready for new rock. By 1982, the record companies began to insist that they manufactured the compilations for KTEL. And then, a much bigger problem. The labels also demanded that KTEL pay for these albums at a royalty included price. You see, the record companies in the beginning of the 80s were starting to sell us finished product. When they sell you finished product, you pay publishing and royalty to them and they ship your product. Now, when they ship your product, not all that product is ever sold. There's 20%, 30%, sometimes you get returns. And I paid them millions of dollars on product that we never sold. And then they went in business on their own, and competition to me anyhow. So, you know, the, the three, four big record companies got together and they, they put together their own product. And I just got cut out of the business. They cut me out of the business. Wasted days and wasted nights. In late 1984, the company was reeling. With no cash on hand, KTEL couldn't get their commercials on TV. And for a company built on the unfailing belief in the power of television, the writing was on the wall. When the company started to dissolve and, and fall apart to an extent, these people were losing their career. Here was an entire family, an extended family, involved. And so it did cause some hard feelings. The problem is we had too much family in the company. I had 13 family members in the company at one time. And they, that was, that was a, that, that was a disaster. There was family that started this off, but then family brought family in that should have never been brought in. And really that was wrong. Uh, people tend to move apart from each other. 
and some of those rifts will probably never be repaired although i think that we're all fairly cordial to each other at this point in time philip after the business fell apart uh, we stopped talking we do a little talking but it was never the same KTEL offices the world over began to close and the US offices entered chapter 11 bankruptcy protection by November of 1984 banks had seized the Canadian assets of the company and closed the Winnipeg head office the largest and loudest marketing company the world had ever known had fallen silent With the collapse of the company in 1984, KTEL struggled in the U.S. under bankruptcy protection. In Winnipeg, the Kivas family went their separate ways. You had uh, two factions in the family, Phil and uh, his brother Teddy and his nephew Mickey Elfenbein uh, on one side, if you like, and uh, Harold and Raymond uh, on the other side, and, uh, and ultimately resulted in Harold and uh, Raymond leaving. After 25 years, it looked like the end of the line for KTEL. But those closest to Phil Kivis knew better. He had two plans, a plan for success and a plan for failure. If the one for success didn't work, he was ready to move in a different direction. From the heights of a $180 million international corporation to the depths of a temporary office in a local hotel, Phil Kivis began to rebuild his empire. Okay, now tell me about the product you have, this tennis ball that you hit and it, bounce, and it bounces back to you. With this power sharpener, dull knives become razor sharp in only seconds. He returned to his gadget roots with a line of TV-friendly products marketed under the banner of K5. K5 was a success, blitzing the airwaves with a familiar hard sell. These are some of the most spectacular crashes ever filled. But to Phil Kivas, K5 was simply a stopgap. Behind the scenes, he and his lawyers wrestled with a lawsuit against the Canadian banks, arguing that KTEL in Canada could have been saved. Canada had no reason to, to go down whatsoever. Yeah, it, it was a, we signed things with the bank that we never should have signed. Then, in 1989, just days before the trial was to start, the banks actually came to me and settled with me because I was suing them. And they settled with me. I got the company back. I got the company's name back. Over the next 10 years, 15 years, that company grew from $15 million back to about $100 million in sales. And basically, basically, we, life went on. It's back, the amazing new KTEL Patty Stacker. Now on special, only $69.95 from KTEL. Comes complete with two heads, extension handles, and power blaster from KTEL. Suddenly, having barely missed a step, Phil was back, scouring the markets, looking for products that would put KTEL back on top. When she, when she leaves, she pays us to use the machine. We rent it to her. Now, let me show you our feature knife over here, the one we call the bonsai knife. The world's greatest pitchman was again sharpening his skills, ready to slice and dice the competition. Look, the tomato's so thin, you can slice the tomato so thin, you can almost read through it now. You, you, it you're, you're back in shape again, ready? Oh, yeah, I still, I still remember a few it's things. It's been a long time since you handled the knife. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to you about the knife set. Right, the bonsai 2000. The bonsai 2000, I want to talk to you about the, uh, about the wax. Right. Car, car wax. I'm ready to go anytime you are. Anything else, anyway. Today, KTEL is a curiosity. They still package, repackage, and license thousands of their songs all over the world, including a recent attempt to cash in on the karaoke craze. Now, KTEL presents DVD Karaoke. And they revived the mini pops. Young, would be singers mimicking adult performers, a formula that was previously a hit for KTEL in the early 80s. On any given day, not even Phil Kivas himself knows what might come next. You know, time is passing by, you're getting older and older, but I don't feel it at all, you know. I just keep on going. I go to work in the morning, I work till 5, 6 o'clock every day, you know. Sometimes I don't even have time to, get, to go for lunch. Really, I'm so busy, I don't have time to get old. 
you're slipping away, learn the tricks of the trade with K Telematics, the game that takes you from rags to riches in just one roll of the dice. Become an inventor you always want to be, make commercials and buy airtime all over the world. But watch those investments. In just one hour, you've learned the secrets and strategies of a real-life company and never had to lose a hair. And even if you do, you can fix that, too. K Telematics, available everywhere. Just tell them you saw it on TV. But wait, there's more.